um, of Amos, uh, where he was starting to talk about the destruction that's impending, that is pending on Israel on the Northern Kingdom. And it was very upsetting <laughs> at that point. I thought we would uh, hold it. Uh, today, we're going to do, I just want to backtrack a little bit to remind you what Paragimma was. Then we'll read again Paragdala to the end. And uh, which really is based, Paragdala basically is Hashem telling through the Navi to the people, this is your time to do tshuva. If you do tshuva, it's not going to happen. I'm waiting for your reaction. <laughs> it's sort of like that. That's really chapter four. Okay, so let's go. I just want to go, oh, excuse me. What am I doing? From here. So it should be right over. That's funny, it's here. Here it is, okay. Uh, so let's go a little bit back, some of the highlights of chapter three, and then we'll go back to chapter four. Chapter three, one of the interesting things was he downplays the idea of the chosenness of Israel. If you remember, I, that's how the chapter starts, right? Uh, on the one hand, it's true. Only have you, only you have I known from all the families of the earth, because it's a responsibility to the fact that you have only, only you have I known. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your sins. In other words, don't think that because you're the chosen people, it means you won't get punished. No, 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 I'm sorry. Honey, put yourself on mute. Oh, oh, I thought it was a question. Sorry, so, sorry. In other words, he's saying the chosenness will not save you. By the way, we have the same thing in Yermiahu, mm -hmm. but Yermiahu, who is talking to Yehuda 150 years later, before the destruction of the first temple. So in chapter 7 in Yermiahu, he says to the people who said, why would God destroy Jerusalem? After all, he has his temple there. But he wants to destroy his own house. So Yermiahu says to the people, don't you remember how he destroyed Shiloh, <laughs> which was the temporary um, uh, tabernacle, Mishkan, that was sitting in the northern kingdom? So just so don't say, hey, chal Hashem, hey, chal Hashem, say, hey, hey, nah. Don't say these are the chambers of God, these are the houses of God. It's about how you act. It's not about who owns the building. So he's saying really the same thing. Don't say because you're the chosen people. Dafka, because you're a chosen people, you have more responsibility than the other nations. And then, of course, he has this whole thing that things happen for a reason. The one who stands behind the reason is God. So, when a lion roars, who doesn't fear? God speaks, all will prophesy. Then he says, because God will not do anything until unless he reveals the secret the servants, the prophets. Meaning Hashem always gives a warning in some fashion. So in the time when the Nevi'im, it was through the Nevi'im. I guess when there's no Nevi'im, it's through the Chachamim. But you also have an interesting here, thing here that when Hashem is speaking, anybody who has prophecy will get it. It becomes overflowing. Okay, then he goes on <clears throat> um, where he talks about um, and the day when I will when I will punish the transgressions of Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, I will visit the uh, I will punish the altars of Beit El. Beit El, of course, if you remember in Yeravam Benavat set up golden calves for worship, which is weird because the golden calf was like the sin of Jewish history at at Sinai at Chorev, but Ravam ben Avad, in order to create uh, another um, place of worship for the Jewish people that they wouldn't go down, I have to say for the Israelite people, because <laughs> it wasn't the tribe of Judah, uh, so they wouldn't go down to Yerushalayim, he created one in Beit El and one in Dan, these two golden calves. So it says, I will punish you, punish the all, I will, I will visit Pakarati, I will remember the altars of Beit El, I need to tear them down. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and shall fall to the earth. I will smite the winter and summer houses, meaning of the rich. Blame the rich because either they're ones who have power. They should be the ones who should realize that if something happens, they share the responsibility. Okay. 
he's, I guess even then, when you had wealth, wealth and power seemed to go hand in hand. Okay. Now we are in, on chapter four. As I said, chapter four, uh, he starts off, um, we had this last time, he starts off making fun of the rich women of the Shomron. I mean, you have these wealthy women, their husbands, I guess, are at work, and they stay home. And all they, to pass the time, they oppress the poor, they crush the needy. And they say to their husbands, bring more, bring more money so that we may drink. So um, what's happening here in general, it, we already started before, but specifically in chapter 4, is that the Israelite kingdom is being blamed for ethical perversions of justice. In other words, they're not being, they're also being blamed for idolatry, but the idolatry is not mentioned. It just says, I'm going to destroy Beit El. And they mentioned another one in this chapter called the Gilgal, which seems to also have been a place of worship, only because the Gilgal is mentioned in the book of Joshua and the book of Shmuel as a place where the Jews uh, came together when they came out of Mitzrayim. So I guess it became a place of, of worship. So he starts off, first of all, ridiculing, just like he ridiculed those who live in the, the summer winter house, meaning the rich in general. Now he starts his cha chapter basically um, rebuking those, the women also, <laughs> who had uh, a great influence. And instead, they oppressed the poor, crushed the needy, and just said, let's bring uh, more to drink, which means they were just, they cared about themselves and not about society. So is is a par they're call he's calling them cows? Yes, because um, I think I mentioned it before. Um, cows are a very expensive animal, and they're very big. And also in antiquity, uh, they were considered very healthy. Okay. <laughs> so I think I mentioned it last time. He the way he translates parot abashan. It's also, of course, um, a parody. But this idea of parat when when we just get to the page, is actually quite a good um, interpretation. It's put out by Mosad Rav Cook. It's called. Um, is that where the fat cow came came into being? Um, possibly. So here he says parat Of course, it's it's um, in, in the feminine, and he says kinui shalag l'neshei shamrona shirot hazololot v'sovot. He sort of it's a parody on the. The um okay. the rich women of Shamron who would you know sit home and eat a lot and lots of cakes whatever so they were quite they were quite uh, obese uh huh okay yeah. but in, and as I said in in antiquity to be obese was a sign of health mm -hmm. and there was also considered a sign of beauty because all that went uh, together and despite this despite was, the fact that they are there was wealthy, no fat shaming no it was no, the exact opposite it was fat fat flattery, <laughs> fat yeah, flattery. At, at the most there could be skinny shaming uh-huh yeah your daughter's so skinny it's like <laughs> along a lot you wouldn't even take you know my mother said along a lot Jim. you wouldn't even put a camel and a donkey for her. <laughs> okay so the Lord has sworn by his holy abode, Nishba Hashem B'Kodsho. B'Kodsho means, of course, by the Beit HaMikdash. That days will come, V'Nisayuchem B'Tsinot, V'Achreichem B'Sirot Duga. You will be taken away on shields to carry you, and then brought. you'll be brought into fishing boats to be taken away. Where will you be taken away to? You'll be taken away to a foreign country. Now the next pasuk is much more derogatory. And through the breaches they shall emerge. Each woman go straight. They will try to run away. They will be cast off. And you shall be cast off the haughtiness. But actually in the Hebrew it says, Vishlachtena ha-harmona. And the harmona, some people translate like the word harem. Um, uh, how do you say um, harem? In other words, they'll be sold into slavery as, as whores. Some right. people say, yeah. So it's quite, uh, yeah, that's according to some of the Parshanim. What does it mean, Vishlachtem Harmona? 
Now, in the next verse, in Dalad, Bo Beit El. Another from here, the the Navi is now being um, facetious, and he's saying, "Okay, keep going to Beit El and rebel. Go to the Gilgal and multiply your rebellion. Rebellion here, the Hebrew is Pesha. Pesha is like an iniquity, a crime, which means." People would go to Beit El, um, which was the place of worship. They would bring a korban to God, and they figured, I brought my korban. I'm okay now. You know, it's like this Christian concept that you give money if you do something wrong to the priest, and then you are, you know, you are, uh, you're back to uh, tabula rasa again. There's a word for it in uh, Christianity. Confession. Um, yeah, and the confession, where there's a word for the, the money that you pay together with the confession. There, there's a term for it. It was very popular in the Middle Ages. That uh, this idea that uh, you just sort of like pay off for whatever crime, and that's it. So people in, in Beit El were thinking this way also in the Northern Kingdom. They would come to Beit El. They'd give a korban. The korban was very expensive. You ever brought a cow, even if you brought a sheep. So rich people would be a cow and a sheep. Now I can go back to what I was doing before because I'm okay with God. <laughs> okay, This was the idea. It's sort of like, um, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's um, almost like a mechanical relation to God. God has his needs, just like in idolatry. right? I have to bring him a carbon. I brought him the carbon. We're okay. <laughs> so I can go back to the way I was. This is basically the same thinking of idol worship. You know, you know, the the gods need something, so I give them their needs, and then uh, they're okay with us. And uh, in the extreme cases, it was even human sacrifice. This idea of the needs of the gods. <clears throat> Among the Greeks, you have that a lot, because the gods are always fighting. But they're human sacrifice going. is not among the Jews. No, okay. no. But this idea of seeing the korbanot as... Um, you know, as uh, that's the, our atonement. We bring the korban, we're fine. By the way, the Christians have this idea. The Christians who don't believe in teshuva, when the Jews lost their temple, from the Christian point of view, they understand you don't have a temple, so that means you can't bring a korban, which means you can't get atonement for your sins, and therefore you're doomed. There is no concept of teshuva in Christianity. Whereas the prophets like Yeshayahu, which the, in the Haftorah that we read on Yom Kippur, Yeshayahu says, is this the fast day that I want? It's funny, we read this on Yom Kippur in the morning. <laughs> is this the type of fast day that I want? You're going to sit in sackcloth. You're going to bend over like a bulrush. And of course you say, uh, Shamnu Bagadnu, that's what I want. That's not what I want. I want you to set the oppressed free. I want you to do justice. I want you to take care of the poor. Then will your light uh, shine again. So in Yom Kippur, we're reading, it's not about the fast. The fast is at the most a, mean to an end, a means to an end. It's about how are you going to be after the fast? If you're going to go back to your ways before, so what's the point? You know, the joke they always say, how come on Ma'ariv, right after Yom Kippur, we start off Ma'ariv as regular, May God forgive our sins. People say, wait, Yom Kippur was over like less than a minute ago. So what are we saying? May God forgive our sins. What was Yom Kippur for if God didn't forgive our sins? So some people say you'd be amazed in how many Averot you can make within those 60 seconds since Yom Kippur was over by gossiping. Um, but I heard of a, a, another interpretation I heard, I think it was from Rabbi Dukman, I don't remember, where he said on Yom Kippur, the whole time on Yom Kippur, we're striving to make ourselves better. And by the time Yom Kippur is over, we actually, we gain some ground, hopefully. And we're actually a better person. So when Yom Kippur is over, all of a sudden we realize, wow, we actually did those sins. <laughs> it's like the whole time before that, we were totally callous to it because that's why we did it. <laughs> we didn't think it was a problem. And now that Yom Kippur is over, we realize, I can't believe we actually did those things last year. So you start Mara with, now that through Yom Kippur, we come to a higher understanding of what we actually did. Now we're saying after Yom Kippur, So, um, 
here the, the Navi is being facetious for the next couple of psukim. The first one is, okay, do like you normally do. Go to Beit El, bring your korban, a fat cow, and then go back to your lives and, and oppress people a little. Go to the Gilgal, another place of worship. And I said Gilgal because that's where Yehoshua brought the people when they came to Eretz Yisrael out of the Mitzrayim. So the assumption is it became a place of worship because it was an important place. Go to the Gilgal, do the same thing, bring a korban, and go back and oppress people. Bring your sacrifices in the morning, every three days your tithes. Here the tithes, some people say, since it's like a sacrifice, it might be Masa Behema. And other people just say no, they brought their, uh, they could be even uh, the tithes in general. But in other words, he's being facetious, facetious. In other words, okay, do what you think is religious. You think that religion is, you go to the Gilgal, you go to the Beitel, you bring a korban, you say a few things, and then you can go back to being evil again. Because... You did your thing, right? But no. <laughs> okay. But he's going to continue this line, uh, this sort of like um, parody of their lives. Right? And bring your sacrifices in the morning every three days. By the way, Yirmiyahu. And Yeshayahu. And who is, and I think there was another Navi. Say that Yirmiyahu says specifically that when, we, when you came out of Egypt, I didn't talk to your ancestors about bringing korbanot. He says specifically. So don't tell me that korbanot is such an important thing. Says Yirmiyahu. You know what? I don't need your Allah. I don't need your zebach, your korbanot. You can eat meat at home. <laughs> Because I didn't tell your ancestors that they had to bring carbonate when they left me try. So don't tell me that carbonate is the whole thing. He says, what I want you, or, or Yeshayahu says, Mi bikesh zot ramos Who asked you to bring these presents? Those of you who come into my temple. That's not the presents I want. And then you go back to oppressing people. What's the point of that? Because these are the same hands that are full of blood. So I don't want these carbon. By the way, it's interesting. If you look in Sefer Shmot, all through Sefer Shmot, with maybe one small exception, there's no mention of carbon. There's carbon Pesach. There is the carbon um, next week's Parsha, which was for the Brit between God and Israel at Sinai. Rashi just says, it's mentioned in Mishpatim, but it happened at Sinai. And um, even the Parshiot, which start from Truma Tetzave, the five Parshiot, where their topic is the temple, the Mishkan, it talks about the Kalim of the Mishkan, the Tzivui, the execution of the act of building the Mishkan, what to build in the Mishkan, what vessels, not a word about korbanot. Yeah, but I mean, Abraham gave a korban. I mean, the forefathers, did, there was I'm that. I'm talking about the temple. Huh. Okay. There's no mention of the korbanot in the Mishkan in Sefer Shmon. There isn't Sefer Vayikra. Which is interesting. So, um, in other words, you have this Mishkan, and it says how to build it, how to make the kalim, how to make the yiriot, how to make the bechitzot, how to make the begadim for the kohanim. Everything. Chuma, tetzave, bayakel, pekudei, all in great detail. But no details about the korbanot. I always say that the mishkan itself means a place. It's a place by itself. It's a place where we're, we're supposed to worship Hashem. That's the Mishka. The Korbanot is because we sinned in the golden calf. So, but the ideal is not the Korbanot. The ideal is not to sin. So, you know, if the ideal was the Korbanot, that means that you're, you're telling the people, okay, go sin and do Korbanot, which is exactly, exactly what happened. People sin, they brought Korbanot, it's okay. That's what takes care of it. No, it doesn't do it. So, okay. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, it's Vayikra, of course, which goes into the Korbanot. But I want to say that by the 
By Shmot, there's very little on Korbanot, which is very interesting. Okay, so go to Beitel and rebel to the Gilgal, multiply rebellion, and don't worry, bring your sacrifices in the morning, every three days, your tithes, and you can assume that God will forgive you, but he won't. It, this is like a parody on them. It's, it's being facetious. And this continues. Offer your Thanksgiving offerings of leavened bread. By the way, the Korban Toda, which is the uh, Thanksgiving offering, was brought together with 40 loaves of bread. Out of 40 loaves of bread, if I, if I remember correctly, 30 of them were were matzah, and 10 of them were chametz. Um, aside from the korban toda, by the way, all the other offerings in the temple were matzah. Even the lechem apanim was matzah. When I say yeah. matzah, it's not the hard matzah that we eat. It means like a pita, something which was baked within 18 minutes. You know, the Yemenites have soft matzah yeah. for Pesach. And, and basically, in general... In antiquity, it seems, people ate unleavened bread because the first um, nation to create leavened bread was uh, the Egyptians. They were the ones who discovered the way to leaven bread and uh, through shmarim, through yeast. Normally, people ate pita. Pita, you throw, like you watch the Bedouins, they have this like, it's sort of like, a, I don't know, it looks like a shield made out of metal. And there's fire underneath it. You just you put the thin um, dough on it, and it bakes within minutes. So if you bake it within 18 minutes, it's not chametz. So that's what people ate. That's why in um, you see at Mitzrayim, um, when the Jews are coming out of Egypt, they're told that at Korban Pesach of Mitzrayim to use matzah. And this is before they left Egypt. So the reason that we always give for matzah is because and there was no time to bake the matzahs. That doesn't hold for the for the night of Pesach because they had to prepare the bread beforehand. So they were told specifically, you have to eat the Korban Pesach on matzah and maror. Why? They didn't leave yet. Because the idea was, you're going to be free. So you're going to be free. You're not going to eat the Egyptian bread anymore. The Egyptian bread is leavened bread. You're going to eat unleavened bread. <laughs> That's what it means to be a free person. You have to be, you have to be proud of your own heritage and not keep taking from other people. So they have eating the unleavened bread, which was what they ate before they came to Egypt. And killing the god of Egypt, which was the Seh, the lamb, or the ram, but it was a lamb in this case. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, there are different interpretations of what this means. Some people say, like before, your korban toda, and it still won't work because you're, you're still doing iniquities. Other people say it's a double parody, meaning bring the whole korban toda out of, out of uh, chametz. They even do it wrong, it's not going to help. Do you do it right or wrong, it's not going to help. <laughs> there are different ways to interpret this verse. But as I said, the Korban Toda, the way we, we know it, was 40 lechamim, 40 breads, 30 of them were matzah, uh, 10 of them were leavened. That's the way it was originally. But the rest of the things done in the Mishkan were chametz, which is interesting when you think of it for a moment, because that means if the Mishkan was mostly chametz, that means that when we are keeping Pesach and eating only matzah, which is not chametz, it's sort of like we're living in the Mishkan for a week because the Kohanim only ate the lechem upon him, which was matzah, meaning unleavened. Yeah, right? It was these 12 breads, showbreads on the table. Um, and during the time of, I think in um, time of Shlomo, they even doubled them up. Or Okay. So offer a Thanksgiving offering of leaven and proclaim and publish free will offerings. Well, free will, meaning the offerings which are voluntary. Nedava, korban nedava means a voluntary offerings. For so you love, because you like doing this. Meaning, good, because you like doing it. But it's not going to help. 
because <laughs> that's not what God wants. He doesn't want more korbanot. Now, the uh, the Navi goes on to talking about some of the punishments that they've already experienced. I've already given you the cleanliness of teeth in all your cities, which means you don't have enough food. Your teeth are clean because there's not enough food. It seems that there was a famine in the cities and a lack of bread in all your places. And you have not returned to me, says God. This term, lo shavtem adai, you have not returned to me, you'll find it now five times. And the idea of the five times is a span of, we're giving, right, we're, it's like a list of numerous possibilities. It's called the five. In, in the number game in the Bible, seven represents nature and all the possibilities. Uh, five is like numerous. You know, the, the morale of Prague says, what's the difference between galut and geula? So you have the word gala and you have the word geula. Right? Exile and redemption. So the difference between Gala and Geula is the Aleph. It says, what's the Aleph? The Aleph is four dots. And the dots are connected at a middle point. That's an Aleph. Right? They're connected at the middle point. So the four dots represent the four sides, north, south, east, and west. And the middle dot is the connecting all the four sides to come to the middle. That's called Geula. So in the Galut, it's gala with the hay. Well, he doesn't actually say that about the hay. In the galut, you go to the four, all the four corners of the earth, and the gula, the olive, is bringing everything back into the center again. That's the difference between gala and gula. It's a maral, right at the beginning of Netzach Yisrael, I think the first chapter. So, I've already afflicted you with famine, the Navi is saying, and you have not returned to me. In other words, the famine that happened to your cities, that was on purpose. So that was supposed to be a warning. So Amos is saying this, you know, openly, you, you had a famine. There's a reason for the famine. Now, I also withheld the rain from you. It's, we're only three months away from the harvest. The harvest is Shavuot time, which is usually the end of May, beginning of June. And uh, if you don't have rain before the harvest, well, you know, the rainy season is over by the end of Pesach, really by the beginning of Pesach. But let's say by the end of Chodesh Nisan, it's still not Simon Klala if it rains till then. So I'm re I've been withholding the rain, and it's three months of the harvest, which means it should have been raining now, and in the middle of the winter, I've been withholding the rain. And sometimes I cause it to rain on one city, and there's a city where I don't even cause it to rain. And sometimes one field will get rain, and there's another field that won't. In other words, the Navi is saying, the rain came in a weird way because it was to tell you that you're not getting the rain properly. And two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water because there wasn't enough rain, there wasn't enough water. And they will not be satiated. And again, you have not returned to me. Again, this term, I did these things and you didn't uh, return to me. I made this famine, you didn't return to me. Um, I, I, I made the rain sparse, you didn't return to me. Uh, and there's also very little drink. I smote you, shidafon of yirakon, last and yellowing, which really means that the crops uh, were going dry. The increase of your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees, the locust has devoured them. You know how the Arba, the locust, comes in when it comes in from the south, from Egypt. They come in these swarms. It's like you can't even see the light of day almost. So many of them come, and they basically eat up the crop, and it's all, all gone. And still you have not returned to me. In other words, I brought from the south locust, and you didn't get the point. I sent pestilence, dever, upon you. Just like happened in Egypt, the time of the... Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, I slew your young men with a sword. Obviously, he's talking about um, some type of um, war which must have happened recently in his time. 
on the captivity, and they took your horses too. And there were your camps. Um, there was a stench that came out of your camps into your nostrils, but you have not returned to me, says Hashem. And also, there was a war where you lost in that war, and you didn't understand that this was also my warning to you. I even overthrown you like God overthrew Sodom and Amorah. And you were like a bland pluck from the burning. You were like Ud Mutsami Eish. You were, you were like um, a piece of wood saved from the fire. And you still didn't return to me. Being I didn't do it completely, I still saved you at the last minute. You didn't turn to me. Lachen ko eselecha Yisrael. Therefore, he says, Ekev kizot eselecha, because I will do this to you, prepare yourself to meet your God, O Israel. Yisrael. Now, this pasuk could be understood in two paradoxical ways, two opposite ways. One is, prepare yourself to meet your God, meaning if you don't do tshuva, God is going to meet you again and give you another punishment. However, it could be the opposite. Prepare yourself to meet your God, meaning do tshuva and you'll meet God and everything will be fine. I mean, God will well, God's it, presence. This is, this is um, Amos talking to B'nai Israel. Yes. The um, northern, like yes, the northern, the northern kingdom. kingdom. It's like um, the way he was rebuking the other nations. He's rebuking B'nai Israel now. That's right. That's and he's it's going, their turn. It's their turn now, right? Okay. And he's going on and on because yeah. remember, rebuking those other nations was maybe a uh, one parrot for all of those six right. other nations or seven other nations. But now he's going on and on. But the interesting thing is that he's rebuking them specifically about things Ben Adam Lechavero and Avodah Those are the two things. The fact, when I say Avodah Zarah, it's the, the specific worship of Beit El. He's not accusing them of pagan gods, but he's accusing them of whatever they did in Beit El and the Gilgal that was wrong. Um, even though he's not specifically mentioning the, um, the golden calves, which is very interesting. Uh, so he's saying to them, they have the wrong concept of, of religion, right? God is not interested in your korbanot. And he's basically rebuking them for, um, for oppre oppressing the poor, for um, using their power to gain uh, wealth on the backs of others, etc. You know, he's these are all ben adam l'chavirot. <laughs> um, last um, Shabbat, I give this little Dvar Torah and Shul at the late minyan. I do that. I'm there quite often. And um, you know, we have a Sarita Dibrot, what we call the Ten Commandments. And um, if you look at a Sarita Dibrot, okay, first five are Ben Adam Lamakom, between man and God. Anochir Shem Lokecha, Lo Yalacha Elohim Acherim. Um, that their honor is like the honor of heaven. The first one's been Adam Lamakum. The second Luach, the second tablet, has been Ben Adam Lachavero, is between man and man. So why are there two Luchot? So I give a very simple explanation. You have two luchot. Every luach is six tzfachim long. There are identical luchot. And one is between man and God. One is between man and man. To tell you that there's no difference. It's not one's more important. They're absolutely equal. <laughs> you know, people have this concept of religion, which we have taken in from the West. I think specifically for the Christians, but even for the Muslims. As if God is more interested in the ceremonial than an Adam Lamako. It's not true. The same Torah that says that you have to you have to eat matzah and pesach is the same Torah that says Lota Shakru, you're not allowed to lie. Lotignovu, you're not allowed to steal. Lota Khashu, Ishba Mito. It's the same Torah that says Where does it say you're not allowed to lie? Chapter 19. Uh. It says, Lot to Shakru. You know, you used to say that all the time, Nechama Leibovich. 
I'm a language at the class. You would say, where in the Torah does it say you're not allowed to lie? And nobody would ever remember. They would say, lo te le pro kil ba mecha, mid var shekha tirchak. says, no, it's by ikra. Lo te shekru. It says, straight away. You know, but anyhow, so all of Vayikra 19, all of Parshat Mishpatim, by the way, is ben adam le chavero. Just at the end, there's a little thing there talks about, it mentions Shabbat, it mentions the Shalosh Shogali, but it's mostly Ben Adam Chavero because, as you know, Derech Eretz Tadma Torah. If a person doesn't know how to do the mitzvot Ben Adam Chavero, they will never reach the level of spirituality that is needed for Ben Adam Mako. You can't I think build most a people need a review of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like there was a rabbi in um, Efrat years ago. His name was Rabbi Moshe Shapira. He had a, a seminar for women. And uh, I heard him speak a few times. I don't even remember where it was. And he said, one of the problems we have in society is the way people see religion. And he gave an example. Let's say you saw a guy who looked really from coming through the airport. And he had this big coat on. And let's say at the um, at the border, somebody stopped him and says, excuse me, open your coat, please. And he opens his coat and you see all these bottles of liquor and uh, that he brought through without, uh, you know, because you're only allowed to bring one liter. And he, so if you saw that, you'd say, well, the dati ganav, that religious guy is a thief. On the other hand, if you see, see a guy who looks very from sitting yeah. in a McDonald's eating a cheeseburger, you would say, He's not religious. Because this association that religious yes. is only Ben Abdam Lamakam and not Ben Adam Lachavero, that is taken straight from Christianity. Yes. I understand. But the Torah doesn't differentiate. The Luchot are equal. They're both yes. six Fachim. They were both given together. The Torah doesn't say that it's more important to eat Matzah and Pesach and not eat Chametz than it is to steal. I don't say that in the Torah. It's all equal. But people don't see it equal. And that's that's one of the... Because you said that if all the things are equal, you would say... In the Torah? All, all in the yeah. Torah. In, in the eyes of yeah. God, all the, all these things are right. equal. Yeah. But you know... Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned it in the sense that people always put the ceremonial before the... That's why I wanted yeah. to mention it. This whole chapter... It's talking about the iniquities of Shomron being ethical iniquity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things that they could um, invent. Right. Oh, not so different from it, it, all history. What? Not so different from all of history today. It's just, you know, it could, you can, you can argue that there are a lot of people that are like that now too. You know, it's all, with, all throughout. People, <laughs> people act like that. There are always going to be packs of people who act like that. There are always people who are going to act like that. But the question is, what does society push towards? That's what education mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Because when you can get away with it, then you do. But if you can't get away with it, then mm -hmm. it's it becomes different. Yeah. Okay. So, so today's society would say bullying and treating other people without respect is a bad thing. Yeah. And it happens anyhow. <laughs> of course, of course. Yes, yes. But, um, but, they, but, we're, but talking the, about, uh, we're talking about much more than bullying. We're talking about a real oppression. Is what? Real mm -hmm. oppression. Yes. Real oppression. Ah, not ex not just exploitation. But well, oppression. exploitation. Um, yeah, also exploitation. That's a part of it. That's a way of oppression. Mm -hmm. How about how about living in Israel? I I always heard that it was on a it was it was like higher a higher mitzvah than all the others not true well it says in the the torah that there are certain there are a few mitzvot that it says it's greater than all the mitzvot mm -hmm. it says that about um tamud torah keneged kulam that studying torah is like all the mitzvot it says that yishuv eretz yisrael shkula keneged kola mitzvot there are a few mitzvot that it says that they're like all the mitzvot it means they're very central these are central ideas to judaism Without the land of Israel, it's almost like Judaism can't take place because the mitzvot in, in Sefer Devarim, even in Sefer Shmot, the mitzvot are, it always says, when you come to the land. 
there is um the the midrash in Sifre, which is a midrash on um Devarim, says that the mitzvot were actually given to be kept in the land of Israel. Aren't most of the mitzvot mitzvot tied to the land of Israel? No, but there are quite a few. But in but the mitzvot in general <laughs> were given to be because it says. Um, be, why? Because it's, the Sifre says this on Bayaim Shamoa. Dvarim chapter 11. Remember what it says in Bayaim Shamoa? It says, mm-hmm. So it's talking about tefillin. <laughs> and it says, and if you do this, you will have uh, extended lifetime on the land. So the Sifre says that in general, the mitzvot were given to do in the land of Israel. And the Sifre actually says, and on the, on the Pasuk of Yermiyahu, had sivilach tzionim, which means make markers so that you know your way back to the land as you're going to Gabbavel. Make sure you have markers that remind you how to come back. So the, the Midrash, and the, it's Midrash Halacha uh, of Sifre. They said, this is to tell you that when you keep the mitzvot out of Israel, these are signs and markers in order to prepare you to keep the mitzvot when you come back to the land of Israel. Okay, people are always educated in Judaism that outside of Israel, the mitzvot that are baguf, you're supposed to keep from the Torah. That's true. And the mitzvot tliot pa'aretz, the only keeper in the land of Israel. That's also true. But the Sifri says that what you're keeping outside of Israel is just to prepare you to be in the land of Israel. It's quite, uh, yeah, the Ramban brings it down. Also, he has a discussion of it. So, um, also on, on Devarim. Um, why am I mentioning this? Where did we start? I can't remember. Ready? I got a bit off on that tangent. Oh, yeah, because you asked me about what does it mean, mitzvot, keneged uh, kola mitzvot. So, there are certain mitzvot where it's very central. The land of Israel is very central. Talmud Torah is a very central mitzvah. So mitzvot, which are considered very central, they are called keneged kol mitzvot. They are called as being weighty as all the other mitzvot because of their centrality. Um, that's it. That's what I think. Um, let's go back to this. And each time it says, Velo and you did not come back to me. Like I did these things. I I it says um I made there were there was wars, there was famine, there was um there was um, um the smiting of the crop and all these things were supposed to be warning, and you didn't take it as a warning. Therefore, this is what I'm going to do to you, O Israel. Prepare yourself to meet your God. He kindly Israel. As I said, prepare yourself could mean. Prepare yourself, meaning do tshuva, and then well, God will forgive you. Or prepare yourself could be, get prepared, because if you don't do tshuva, God is going to smite you. So it's one of the two. You know, it's a funny thing, the Talmud in Brachot, in Perkhamishi, on this pasuk, prepare yourself to meet your God Israel. It says from here you know that it's good to wear an upper garment before you daven, because it says prepare yourself. <laughs> to meet your God Israel. So it's good to wear a jacket or an upper garment when you're going to daven so that you're preparing yourself for the davening. But obviously that's not what this Pasuk is talking about. So it's very interesting how Chazal takes sometimes psukim totally out of context in order to justify a minhag which they think is a good minhag. Even though when you look at the context, it's really not talking about davening here. So um, I just I'm pretty, I sure low, I'm pretty sure lower garments are equally important. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely if they're tzitzit. Yes. <laughs> no, that's okay. funny, Michelle. Gonna, everyone, they'll say it says in the Torah. Right. Now this is a very this is a very um well known pasuk. Kine Yotzer Harim Vore Ruach, he who forms the mountains and created the winds. Umagid la dam and can tell a person what he said during that day, what he had talked about. Oseh shachar eifa, he can bring dawn into darkness. V'dorech abamotearetz, and he treads on the high places. Hashem Elohei Tzvaot, Shmo, the Lord of hosts, is his name. 
So God controls everything, basically the Navi is saying, and God is bringing you ample warnings one after another. So I'm telling you straight away, change your ways if you want this to stop. But there always is the possibility. It's like, you know, the, the Rambam says, there's an argument between the Rambam and the Raul Bag, David Ben Gershom. Rambam's position is, when a Navi makes a nevua prophecy for the good, it has to happen. When a Navi makes a prophecy for the bad, for punishment, it doesn't have to happen for the simple reason that people can do tshuva. Meaning, a bad prophecy or a bad tiding in a prophecy is conditional because the whole point of the prophecy is for people to do tshuva. So, of course, it's conditional. When it's a good prophecy, it's not conditional. That's why, for instance, when the Talmud in Sanhedrin brings a machloket between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Lezer, whether the geula is contingent upon tshuva of the people, where the people have to do tshuva in order for the redemption to happen. So Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Chaver, who was a Talmud of a Talmud of the Vilna Gon, he was a legalist and a Kabbalist in Lithuania in the middle of the 19th century. In his parish on the Talmud Sanhedrin, he says, I don't get it. What's the argument? <laughs> there can't be an argument. The Torah promised that there's going to be Geula, so there's going to be Geula. It can't be contingent on anything because it's a positive prophecy. Positive prophecies are not contingent. Only negative prophecies are contingent. So what's the argument? <laughs> so, and then he tries to explain what the argument would be. But he just says it doesn't make sense. The Torah promises Geula. How can you say there's not going to be because it's contingent on doing tshuva? That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that that basically was chapter uh, four. And the, all of chapter four then is um, is this um, uh, this warning that the people should do to shuva. Um, maybe I'll, I want to bring the first two psukim in chapter five just to show you how also the Talmud turns around a pasuk, and this one they do on purpose, not just to use it as a, a smachta, as a hint for something else. Hearken to this word which I have taken up for a lamentation over you, house of Israel. First of all, the prophet says, I'm starting already to lament you, because <laughs> I'm not sure you're going to do it. So he says, I'm lamenting you, but I'm telling you, you can still stop this. Now, the second passage is very interesting. Nafla la tosif kum betulat Yisrael. The virgin of Israel has fallen, and she now she and shall not and shall not continue to rise. She is spread out on the soil. There is none to raise her up. Right, this is a very heavy pasuk. Betulat Yisrael is the term for the Jewish people that we find in Sefer Malachim. You find it in um, here in Amos, I think even in in um, possibly in Yirmiyahu. So it says, She's fallen and she will not rise, which means if you don't do tshuva, God will smite you to such a way that you will fall and not rise because the 10 tribes went into Galut. Now, this verse, which is possibly the epitome of negativity in this um, of all these nevuot, the Talmud says on Dafhe and Brachot. So the Talmud says, um, in Eretz Yisrael, on the land of Israel, they used to read this Pasuk differently. Instead of, Nafla kum, she fell and will not rise again, O daughter of Israel, the way they read it was, Nafla tosif, she will not fall again. Kum betulat Yisrael, it's time to rise, O daughter of Israel. <laughs> Meaning they played around with the commas and they read the Pasuk differently. They said, right, Naflalo Tosif Kum, which means Naflalo Tosif, she won't fall again, Kum Betulat Israel. So it's interesting how they took a negative Pasuk and turned it into the positive, which means that same Pasuk, if you just change the Nikud, the commas and whatever, it, um, it becomes a positive thing. And all these 
There are also those who have pointed out that even when you look at the klalot, the curses in Devarim, that these um, curses, if you sometimes change the commas, they can come out like blessings. Because every curse has within it the possibility of blessing. Because the point of the curses and the point of all the negativity are basically warnings. And if you heed a warning, then you flip them to the other side. That's why there's always brachot before the klalot. Okay, we'll end on that point. So is, is the rest of the book just rebuking and rebuking? No. But each chapter okay. is really a little bit different. But yeah, he's um, he hit them over the head in these last uh, 